Hello, everyone. Welcome to this episode of the Aurelius Podcast. We have Andy Budd this time around of ClearLeft, a digital product and service design agency based in the UK. Andy and I covered quite a lot of ground, and we talked about some of the beginnings of ClearLeft and, and how and why they started that agency, and even how the relationship has changed between you know the work that they do and their clients. And Andy, like me, has a great appreciation for using analogy in describing some things in design. So we had some fun with stuff like that. But our conversation kept coming back to this idea of doing proper research and really sitting with the data, analyzing it, synthesizing it, turning it into insights to get to design. And Andy has a lot of great information and tips on how we do that in a very tactical way. And this is also a really good point for me to uh, bring up for you folks that we recently launched Aurelius version 2 into beta. And that is a user research and insights platform for design and product teams. Exactly folks like you listening to this podcast. We're in beta right now. You can actually sign up to get access on our homepage. You go ahead to www.aureliuslab.com. That is A-U-R-E. L-I-U-S-L-A-B dot com. If you go ahead over there, sign up. I'll be sure to get you an invite and you can come check us out and let us know if we're helping you do better research and synthesis. But with that, on to the show. Welcome to Aurelius Podcast, episode 13 with Andy Budd. CEO and co-founder at ClearLeft, a digital product and service design agency based in the UK. Andy, welcome to the show. Uh, so glad to be here, man. Really looking forward to our chat. I am as well. So, you know, Andy and I were chatting uh, just a bit before we actually started here, and, and I had actually had a chance to run into Andy many, many years ago with the uh, the now Deep Six Idea Conference, but back in Philadelphia, <clears throat> and uh, so not only is Andy uh, a prolific designer, especially based in the UK, uh, as well as around the world, but he is also a, a speaker and author. And so we're really glad to have have you here to share some of your thoughts with the folks who listen to the podcast. Great. Well, thanks for having me. And I'm so glad that you mentioned that conference because I had a blast there. And Philly is, is such a great city. I mean, um, uh, you know, I've, I've long been a fan of Philly through the work of folks of like Happy Cog and Dan Maul. So it was a real pleasure to get there to kind of like wander the streets to see the town. Um, didn't have any chili feasteak because cheesesteak because I'm a vegetarian, but I kind of I watched on as as my friends enjoyed it, and it was a really fun conference. It's a shame it only had a couple of a couple of runs, but um, but yeah, very nice to kind of finally connect after all these years. It must be five or six years, I reckon. I would think so. Yeah, I think that that's right. Well, it's also I was going to say it's also very kind of you to say that I'm a I'm a well renowned designer. I think these days I spend more of my time sending emails and sitting in meetings and having coffees with people than actually doing any any work in in anger. Um, but uh, but yeah, it's nice to see that that myth of me still <laughs> having some kind of creativity left is is, is still going around. So well, for that. yeah, no, absolutely. Well, at least certainly in my eyes, and uh, and I would suspect a great many others. So. Um... No, that's that's awesome. Why don't you tell us a little bit more about the work that you are doing these days before we kind of dive into the meteor stuff? Sure. I mean, uh, so I, as you said, I run an agency called Clear Left. We we started in um, the UK around two thousand and five. We started in a time when design was still very immature, particularly digital design. You know, most design projects started with up opening up Photoshop, moving things around, making them look pretty. I came back from a background where that just really seemed crazy to me. It was unscientific. So before starting Clear Left, I was working in an agency where I was doing information architecture and doing user research and doing um, usability testing and all of the sort of elements and components um, that effectively sort of merged into this sort of emerging discipline of UX design. At the time, there wasn't really a, a name for it, but around 2004, 2005, Friends of ours in Adaptive Path started sort of popularizing this sort of movement that was sort of coming out of the, the tech companies of, of San Francisco and Silicon Valley. And we just realized that this was the, the way forward, that we wanted to try and bring um, a user centricity to projects. So rather than just focusing on the client needs, you wanted to focus on the user needs because we felt that by satisfying the user needs, you'd meet the client's needs. 
And also, we didn't like the idea of just, you know, the blank page and, and focusing design purely on inspiration. Design in my book, particularly digital design, um, is there to solve a problem, a human problem, a business problem. And so we looked around and we couldn't see anybody else in the UK doing that. So we started Clear Left. Um, I don't know if we are technically the first UX agency in the UK, but we're definitely the first that we were aware of. Um, and the early days, it was really tough trying to push UX as a as a practice because our clients would be, well, what the hell is UX and why are you charging us a week? But slowly we kind of pushed it forwards and um, through our public speaking and through the books that we've written and through the conferences we've organized, we've kind of helped, you know, one of many people, but have had a field. And so now our clients come to us usually already understanding the field, understanding the discipline, understanding the need to talk to users, understanding the need to kind of talk to stakeholders and bring all this stuff together. Um, uh, and so really this is on is designing products and services for people. We tend not to work in the marketing space. We tend not to do mi mi micro sites or sites to promote, you know, drinking more fizzy drinks or, or more sugary snacks. Um, our focus is really trying to help people design better tools and better services. And so that's kind of what we do. Um, over the last 18 months, we've helped companies like Virgin Holidays, who are a big travel brand in the UK, um, John Lewis, who are a big um, superstore, I guess they're similar to like a, um, I, I don't know, a Macy's or a Nordstrom or something, I guess. Um, we've worked with, uh, yeah, a whole, a whole bunch of interesting kind of retailers, app manufacturers. Um, Penguin Books is a company that we spent a, quite a lot of time working with. So, yeah, just, you know, everything from kind of small startups to kind of fairly big companies, trying to help them improve their products and services. Um, and I think what we've found over the last few years uh, being an agency is the nature of the agency relationship has changed. And I think we've got, we've stopped doing mostly standalone projects. We've stopped just kind of like having work thrown over the fence, delivering it and throwing it back. And a lot more of our work nowadays is working with in-house teams to help supercharge them, to help coach them, to help push them forwards. And the ideal is all the skills and capability they need to pick that project up and run with it. Because I think previous to that, the agency with the product stopped as well. You know, as soon as it was done, it was handed over and then it atrophied for mm. three or four years. And now what we're trying to encourage is internal teams to take ownership, to move forwards, to constantly improve and tweak. And, and so when that happens, when we hand the baton over to the designers we've been working with and they run with it, we get a huge sense of satisfaction. And we know that that, that project is in good hands, is going to live on, you know, and grow. And Fascinating story, not only of how Clearleft began, uh, but as well as how you're evolving now, it's interesting too. Peter Merholtz on our show, one of the co-founders of Adaptive Path, <clears throat> and I want to tie this together because something you said early on and how you think about design is very much more science, uh, simple inspiration or creativity. And a lot of us would agree, and I say us being uh, the, those of us here at Aurelius, and of course those who I believe listen to our podcast. And you know, one of the things Peter and I talked about was. Uh, Peter said he takes a sort of lawyer-like lawyer approach to design, where essentially you're gathering all the evidence you can to present a case that you believe best meets that need, best solves that problem. And that's just simply the approach mm. that you take. Uh, and I, I was just going to say, I mean, I, I often use the metaphor not so much of a lawyer, but of a, of a detective in a kind of Scandi noir kind of sort of fiction program. Because a lot of it is it's, it's sifting the evidence it's sticking all up on the wall. It's absorbing it. It's making those connections. Um, and I kind of joke that, like, if you know, if you hiring a designer, if it's a good designer, their workspace <laughs> should look like a murder's happened. Um, and if you're a bad designer, it should look clinically clean. Um, the other thing I think is really relevant is like, you know, with these kind of like, you know, TV crime movies, there's always like the jaded old cop that's <laughs> always done it this way and and will never change. I would always jump to the most obvious conclusion, the most obvious kind of criminal and not, you know, they'd get their person and then, you know, the, the story will plan out that it's clearly not that person. And, and and I think we see that a lot. A lot of agencies, a lot of designers jump to the most obvious solution. But the most obvious solution isn't necessarily the best solution. Often it's the worst solution because it's the most obvious one because it's somewhere they've seen before. And I think by bathing in this information and by letting yourself follow these clues and these threads and these trends, what ends up happening is you end up being more generative and you deliver more and more and more and more ideas. 
And then once you've got a whole bunch of potential candidates or potential um, uh, felons, then you can go through and you can kind of um, discount them one by one until you're left with the one that is the best fit for solving the problem. So I love I love that kind of um, and I pref- frankly I prefer to see myself more as a as a as a kind of um, as a as a hard boiled detective than a lawyer. Um, so yeah, that would be my that would be my pitch. Uh, anybody who knows me knows that I absolutely love the use of analogy, both in illustrating uh, design, but just general concepts. So I kind of want to keep running with this uh, with you, if you don't mind. (laughs) And so you talk about, you know, you talk about really gathering the evidence and sifting through this information and filtering that. Talk a little bit more about what that means in practically applied terms for you, for us as an industry. Sure thing. Um, We... The first stage of any engagement with Cleft is usually some kind of immersion phase, discovery phase, pilot project, you know, whatever you will call it. Um, and that typically will take three parts. The first part, um, and, and usually, you know, because of time and budget, a lot of these things break down into kind of six week blocks. So quite often the initial discovery phase would be six week long sprints. The first two weeks would typically be that evidence gathering. Um, we'd start by some desk research. It might be looking at analytics. It might be looking at any user research they've done already, if they've created personas, if they have some um, you know, data on, on performance, et cetera, et cetera. They've, you know, like most organizations now, they probably you know, commissioned some great piece of strategy 18 months ago, and it's been sat in a PowerPoint deck ever since. So try and pull that out. And once we start to get a bit of a flavor of what they know, that also helps inform what the gaps are and what they might don't know or, or, or might think they know. But um, typically before talking to users and customers, we'll start by interviewing stakeholders. We'll try and build a list of um, representative stakeholders. Clearly we want to talk to the people who are actually, we're solving their business problem, but also we want to talk to the people who are going to be affected by the result of this new product or service. They might be the people using it, maintaining it, building it. Um, marketing, et cetera, et cetera. And also we want to talk to the people who are the head of the organization to understand how the product or service fits in with their broader goals. Um, a lot of businesses kind of push back and will go, well, we, we already know all this stuff. But you'll be amazed. Like when you get a group of people, there's a tendency for everyone to agree. Once you actually get people on their own, you're, you're much more likely to understand where the differences are and where the different um, goals are. And actually, you know, spending time with a finance um, director, they're going to have a very different outlook of what they want to get than the head of marketing or the head of design or the head of technology. And so, you know, sort of separating these people off and finding out what they really need to achieve and what will make them feel good and what will make them f- look good as well. Because, again, a lot of this stuff, you know, you've got the organization needs, then you've got the individual stakeholder needs. And if you're not satisfying the stakeholders, then they're going to be frustrated. They're going to be potentially blocking what you're trying to do. So trying to bring all these people along on the journey. Um, and once we try to gather this information, once we know what the organization are trying to achieve, we'll often kind of do the same process and go out and talk to prospective customers. Um, and yeah, one-on-one conversations, maybe backed up with some surveys. Possibly if it's an existing product or service, we might do some usability testing or we might do some mirroring or kind of really light ethnography to understand what their frustrations are and what their issues are. Um, We might do a bit of user journeys and and map the pain points. And then we'll probably take the information and the insights we've gathered from talking to the users, play those back to the customers or the clients and say, well, look, you thought the problem was X. Actually, we've We've done our analysis and we think the problem is X, but it's also Y and Z. You have a belief that this thing is working really well, but actually our our studies have shown that you've got bigger problems here, here and here. And by having that conversation and by surfacing that information, then you get a much broader picture of, of, of what's wrong. And once we've got this understanding, then we can kind of start um, working with our customers or sometimes with their users to start exploring potential solutions that might be through workshopping co-design sketching exercises um or it might be through us just kind of you know using our brain power to kind of prototype really really quickly and then present that back and iterate etc etc but basically coming up with hypotheses um, and then try to test those hypotheses out as quickly as possible 
um, to make sure that the thing we're designing actually kind of meets as many needs as we can. The challenge always is, is that you know, it's never possible to create a product or service that does everything for everybody. So there's always compromises. But I think by understanding what those compromises are and by going in with your eyes open, then you save a lot of problems later on. Like a Benjamin Johnson or whatever said, you know, something along the lines of plans are useless, but planning is vital. And I think that's that's for us as well. The planning process is the important thing. It's not the output. It's not the doc. So we tend to have a very loose approach to project management. Like we don't have a clear left trademarked kind of diagram that has little kind of squiggles and, you know, lines and what have you. It's It's about asking questions responding to those questions, gaining understanding and insight, and then using that knowledge to level up and then ask the next question and, and solve the next problem. And so, but you know, you know, going back to your conversation with um, with Peter, like most agencies, at the end of the day, most designers, we kind of sort of use the double diamond um, kind of approach to design, which is, you know, going broad and going narrow, asking questions, exploring, and then you get discovery and asking questions. The next two weeks would be bathing in the information and understanding it and making some matching. And then the last two weeks would be nailing that down into some kind of proposal, some kind of concept, um, some kind of tangible thing that we can, and thinking comes in. Um, you know, and people would argue whether design thinking is a thing or whether it's emperor's new clothes. And I'm not really interested in that, that, that debate. Such. But I think a lot of the tools that that people do use when they claim they're using design thinking are tools that other people use as well. You know, they're, they're good analytical problem solving skills. I think the key thing that designers can add is the ability of manifesting that in a visual way. So rather than coming back to your client with a written proposal or a PowerPoint deck with lots of really badly typographed kind of, you know, like arrows pointing everywhere, Coming back with something that is much more tangible, um, a poster, a video, um, a design concept, something that you can, is, is still rough, you can still pull it to bits, but something that is solid enough that everyone can look at it and go, that's what I wanted, or that isn't what I wanted, or I can see problems here or problems there. And so manifesting conceptual business problems in a, in a visual way, I think is one of the best powers that designers and design thinking can bring to the problem. So that's what we try and do. Yeah, I actually really very much appreciate personally the fact that you describe your approach as less about steps in a process that we take and more mm. about a philosophy that, you know, hey, we want to ask some questions. We want to understand the meaning of those questions and then make the best adjustments in course or uh, proper next steps from what we learn rather than having, you know, having yeah. a constrained process to ourselves. and. Well, I mean, I think. Uh, sorry, I, I was just say, I think I do think project management is really important, but in in an agency setting and maybe in, internally as well, I think project management is kind of like an industrialized process. The purpose of having really, really rigorous project management is to ensure that whatever you put in, you get a consistent and timely output. And so, if your goal is consistency, having a rigid project project management process makes sense. Like, if you're building an oil rig. You want to make absolutely sure that it's not going to blow up and you want to make absolutely sure it's going to be delivered on time. I think when you're doing something creative, consistency is less important than quality. And when you're focusing on, on quality, I think project management actually, it manages replicability, but it doesn't encourage um, getting that extra 20%. So I think a lot of agencies have a really rigid process, partly because they hire very junior people and those junior people only know one or two or three techniques. So they, they feed them into this process that says like, well, we absolutely have to use, you know, insert prototyping tool and insert design tool and insert this. And you do this, this, this and this. And very junior teams can very quickly understand that process. With clear left, we're not wanting to kind of effic efficiently deliver the 80% we're more concerned about the last 20%. And to do that, you need to hire smart people that have a whole toolbox of tools and know when to use those tools. And also, if that's the case, and if you want to have the, the best people use the right tools, you can't tell them what tools to use three months in advance before you even know what the problem is. It's kind of like phoning up a, a plumber and saying, look, I want you to come around and fix my boiler, but I want you to use a wrench and a hammer and a, and a this and a that. And, and the plumber's like, well, I don't even know what the problem is. You can't, you, you can't you know, decide on that. And so we're trying to maximize 
the optimal potential rather than than max uh, the, the sort of minimize you know kind of variance and and and, and um uh, and maximize consistency and that's what really excites us but the, the 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 challenge with that is you can't do that at scale um you know we're a small agency we're 30 people you know we're never going to be a 500 person company if you're a 500 person company or a 5000 person company you need governance and you need process in place because there aren't 5000 amazing UX designers that have been doing this for 15 years so you need to figure out ways of of leveling people up so we're quite fortunate of having those experienced people that, that that don't need so much in the way of rails I guess I want to take a moment and go way back to something earlier when we were using the detective film noir uh hard-boiled <laughs> sort of scenarios much of it comes into gathering that evidence and sifting through it and with that a little bit more and just I would ask directly how do we make sense of this that we gather both in the conversations with you know our customers or clients or stakeholders um, as well as the prospective customers or users of the product or service we're designing for um so um in in kind of um sort of I guess it's philosophy um there are there are three modes of thinking. You have deductive reasoning, um, which is kind of um, effectively the mode that scientists use. You know, it's very it's very logical. It's very kind of linear. Um, and actually, this is t- typically how you see dev teams working, how technical people working. They work in a very deductive way. You have um, inductive reasoning which is um much more around um looking at patterns and looking at statistics and and kind of um measuring um uh kind of like probabilities and um that's you know that that's kind of very sort of you know the 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 business way of um kind of looking at stuff but then you have a kind of a third mode of thinking, which um, is, oh God, I've forgotten the name now. It's terrible. It was on the tip of my tongue a second ago. Um, abductive. Inductive, deductive, abductive, yeah. Um, you've got abductive reasoning, which is kind of typically the mode that the designers use. And actually, I think it's the mode um, that, that, that design thinking is based around. And I typically design, d- define design thinking as effectively the use of abductive thinking along with the tools and techniques that designers have developed over the years to kind of understand and explore this space, plus the making of this information visible. And I think it's the making of the information visible that allows the abductive process, because effectively what you do is you 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 take this information and you internalise it, um, which is actually one of the reasons why I think it's important for designers to do their own research. Um, it's the same as like, uh, you know, people maybe sometimes use this as a false equivalence, but um, I think designers not doing their own research is the same as designers trying to get the benefit of a holiday by reading the postcard that their friend sent back from their holiday. Because I think you need to internalise this stuff. And so I think you go through a process of discovery, you internalise it, you visualise it. And then these the subconscious kind of adductive processes start working through. They start spotting patterns. They start kind of making leaps of faith. And so it, it's kind of, you know, that's why it's really difficult to kind of systematize and, 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 and turn this into a process because a lot of this stuff is kind of subconscious. A lot of this stuff is based around years and years and years of training and spotting patterns and seeing what, what works and what doesn't. And so, like I say, I think I think it's just, it's, it's, it's sifting the evidence. It's it's putting it all up in a visible visible place. It's spotting the patterns. It's getting little sparks of insight. It's trying things out and then seeing whether those work and those map to the model that you've kind of created. And so yes, yeah, it's, it's, it's an abductive thinking process, which I think is um, uh, at, at its key. I would argue. Oh, pleased to hear you discuss those three modes of thinking because this was something that I personally research in strategy work for design and and the thoughts around abductive thinking where I were was originally introduced to was uh, via John Coco in his book and a lot of the things that he discussed there. And and I thought that that was very brilliant work. And so because we've got into this, what we do, you know, here at Aurelius, we are trying to help people uh, make better sense of their user research and insights for design and product work. Right. And the question I often get asked is 
how do you make sense of this information? So we've touched on something here. It's a mode of thinking. Your favorite example of this kind of abductive thinking where you yourself and your team perhaps have a aha moment by, by you know, sifting through this information and using that mode of thinking in some way. Um, that's a very good question. Um, it's difficult to know whether the insights I mean again so I, I should probably point out to your listeners that I am not a kind of a design philosopher so you know I don't have a, a, a deep kind of academic knowledge of, of different modes of thinking it's just something that I'm kind of interested and curious in and I genuinely believe that these modes of thinking tend to kind of reflect different disciplines in organizations and you typically have the inductive thinkers who are designers the inductive ones who are who are the marketing department and the, the the deductive ones who are tech and actually i find that in a lot of organizations one or two of those sort of ways of approaching the world are missing and i actually think that makes the the organization weaker for it i can't necessarily sort of with with any certainty say that this example i'm going to give you was a result of that abductive thinking above and beyond the fact that I think that's the mode designers use in general. But we were recently um, tasked with redesigning uh, Penguin Books. So Penguin Random House, very, very large book company, merged. Um, they found themselves with about 600 websites um, that they needed to turn into one website. So that's already a big information architecture project. Um, they had loads of stakeholders, both internal, Some, sometimes because they, they'd just merged, there were often people that had the same job title and maybe even thought they were doing the same thing, but, but you know, that had come from the different organisations. And then we had the users, the customers um, and authors. So it was a really, really big kind of complex, um, uh, complex stakeholder and user map. And so we go out and we, we sit and we talk to customers, we talk to um, authors, we talk to stakeholders, and we just start building this picture. And it just starts to become clear that um, they're never going to compete with Amazon. You know, when you wake up in the morning, you think, I'm going to buy a book, I want to see a review. You don't think, oh, I'm going to go to a publisher site. You think you're going to go to Amazon because people have been trained over many, many years. Um, but we came to the realisation that, that this organisation, what they had, is they had so much knowledge and passion about their domain, about their authors, about the topic that they that they were interested in. You know, the, the, the people who were commissioning editors kind of knew everything about the history of the authors and what they were working on next and what they were working on in the past and where they were, etc. We kind of realised that that would be a huge opportunity there. And so the kind of the, the pitch that we made back to, to Penguin effectively is like, we believe you should be the, the IMDB for your, 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 your publishers. And rather than, and, and then obviously through conversations, one of the challenges is that, you know, most of these companies have got small marketing teams and producing original content was tough. And so it's like, well, rather than constantly producing original content, there's already loads of content out there. Why don't we try and pull this in from all the sources? So if your author goes on breakfast TV and, and, and speaks about their upcoming book, let's grab the video. If they've got a double page spread in The Guardian, let's, you know, let's pull that article in. If they're going to be talking at a local literary festival, let's bring that in. And let's make you the kind of the, the centre for excellence, um, the, you know, the one-stop shop for any fan that wants to know about your, your products and services. And this came from lots of conversations. It came from understanding the need of the authors to communicate and connect with the audience. It came from understanding what and why audience members came to the site and also what they were frustrated by. And it came to an understanding of what the organization's business goals were. And none of these individual things in and of themselves would have been enough to suggest that suggestion. But all together, um, it, it, you know, it just kind of sort of made sense that there was an opportunity there to um, to solve that problem in a way that hadn't been kind of considered before. And so that's what we, we set out to do. Um, and so, yeah, it's, you know, it was a formative process that, that the, the solution didn't come fully formed. It came. Uh, but the other thing is, like, one of the things I find weirdly is I, I think it's really easy for the designer to kind of place themselves at the center of the, the the process and be the hero in their own hero's journey. 
And actually, the way I like to see design is much more like a, a, an archaeological dig, you know, to go back to your your idea of, of having kind of um, sort of, you know, sort of concepts to explore. And, and I generally believe like the organisation and the authors and the customers at some deep level knew what the right solution was. They just couldn't articulate it or they couldn't join it up. And so it required a team to come in with their spades and their shovels initially, you know, a bit kind of aggressive and a bit kind of big and messy. And then, you know, little trowels and then finally little dusty things to try and uncover this thing that was sitting there and staring them in their face. And weirdly, like I would imagine if we went back to the the organisation now, the organisation Penguin would go, well, clearly that was obviously what we wanted you to do. And you were really helpful in helping us deliver it. But we already, already knew this stuff. Because I think once you kind of like uncover this stuff, it just becomes obvious. But at the start, you don't know what's 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 below the but you know below the kind of subconscious or, or, or kind of hidden underground. So yeah, most of the time we're we're archaeologists. We're not coming up with genius ideas. We're just we're just uncovering them and then presenting them back to the organisation in a way that they immediately get. Yeah, that's that's a really fun story. I, I'm going to try to summarize some of the high points of what I think I heard you say, which is is just. So very simply, we found a lot of the dusty bits that were already in their organization and knowledge that we had from their customers and really connected the dots between those things where they otherwise may not have been able to. Hmm. Yes, I think that's a good analogy. Yeah, it was like these ideas were already present. We just had to facilitate the connecting of them. Yeah, That's a very interesting concept. And uh, I was asked, we're afraid that we're not going to be able to find that pattern or the theme or the thing that your answer, because I think it's very relevant, especially to, you know, the story and example you just gave. Yep. Um, I, I'm going to answer it, but may, maybe not answer it in full. So I, one of the great things at Clear Left is, you know, we, like I say, we hire mostly senior people, but we realize that that means that there's um, a kind of a whole sort of group of new designers coming into the market that can't benefit from our experience so over the last kind of well pretty much over over the last 10 years we've been bringing in interns and so a lot of these interns are straight from university or maybe one two years into their career and one thing that i have spotted is a really really common pattern of behavior that i think um is incredibly problematic for new designers and i understand why it's there but it's a difficult habit to break um, and, and that habit goes back to what we were saying right at the start of the, the show, which was a desire to jump to the first most obvious solution. And the reason it's there is actually often because of the way teaching happens. Because if you are a student at university, you're probably working on a project on your own or with one or two other people. You probably have a crazy deadline. Deliver this thing in two weeks time. And so what happens is you end up doing research theatre. You end up doing research, you're going out and speaking to people, not because you're really hoping to get the insight or you really understand what you're doing with it, but because your lecturer has told you that this is how good design works. So almost it becomes cargo cult thinking. You go out there, you assemble, are you, you're familiar with cargo cults, are you? I, I'm not, let's... Uh... Oh, okay, so, okay. You're now not going to have, you're going to have to like break this episode up into two or three parts, I think, because you've kind of, you've, you've accidentally fallen into one of my favourite things. So I'm going to go <laughs> off on a slight tangent here. So cargo cults, basically, towards the end of the, 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 the war in the Pacific, um, you know, you had all of these sort of American troops landing on these, these tropical islands with planes and trucks and boats and cargo guns, sweet, you know, Coca-Cola, etc. So all of these kind of islanders like had this sudden burst of wealth. But this this burst of wealth was beyond their technical knowledge. So they didn't understand how all this stuff worked. As soon as the war finished, all of this wealth and all of these American GIs left. And so the, the islanders like, well, we want to get this wealth back. And so they built bamboo aeroplanes. And they cleared forests and they made sort of bamboo conning towers and, and pretend uh, airstrips because they didn't understand how planes and airports and, and, and cargo travel worked. So they thought if they built these things, somehow they would summon all these wealth you know, goods down from the sky. And, and it's this idea that, uh, of like fixating on the trappings of things, what something looks like, rather than having a deep understanding of how it actually works. And so cargo cult thinking I see happening a lot in design where people are mimicking what they see 
other designers doing without truly understanding the mechanisms behind why these things work. So you go out, you talk to a couple of users, you go, chick, check, that's my talking to users bit done. Now I'm going to go off and somehow insight is going to happen. Um, and so I think teaching people actually genuinely good um, research is important. I also think not rushing people to a solution. So a couple of years ago, we had a team of three interns um, and, you know, we set them a, a three month project to come up with a, a new product or service that would enrich the lives of the residents of Brighton where I lived. And like, you know, they came back to us in the first three days going, hey, we've, we've solved it. And we looked at it and it was like, well, that's 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 been done before. It's the most obvious solution, yada, yada, yada. And they were like really frustrated because the whole of their lives up to that point have basically been about having genius ideas, pleasing their superiors. And when we said, well, no, that's not really what we're looking for. Go back and think a little bit more. And so they came back two weeks later and they were like, well, we've solved the problem. And it was like, what did you? Well, we talked to a couple of people in the street and now we've kind of um, we've got the answer. And again, it was really, really shallow. And it took the third time to say, no, really go and talk to people, really understand the problem, really immerse yourself in the feeling, in the frustration um, and spend more time. And, you know, two, three weeks later, they came back and they'd got it by that time. And they had really immersed themselves in the problem. They had really understand what was going on. They had genuinely come up with solutions that weren't the most obvious ones. But, and we sort of forced them to do a bunch of exercises. I think we, this was a different team now, but one team that was having the same problem, we said, okay, go away. And we want you over the course of a week, each one of you, there were three of you, to come up with a new design idea every half a day. And so they came back to us like a week later and they had, what, 6, 12, 24, like 36 designs, ideas. And so they'd cycled through this stuff. And then based on the research, we could look at it and go, okay, well, that has some promise, that has some promise, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so doing, doing research theatre and not allowing yourself the time to generate ideas above and beyond the obvious, I think are the, the biggest risks that, that designers have. The other thing I think is maybe being a bit mean now, but you have all these kids coming out of university who have been told how smart and how clever and how special they are. And then maybe they go into Facebook and they're told that they're even smarter and even clever <laughs> and even more special. They're so special that you're going to have free massages and you're going to have, you know, free laundry, et cetera, et cetera. But they're given really, really kind of like, you know, tram line problems. Like if you go and work at Facebook, you've already got a design language created. You've already got component libraries created. You're effectively moving bits and pieces around and you're given, you're being given very, very specific problems. And so this idea of, of having having a really broad um, problem to tackle and having no kind of scaffolding around can be terrifying. So I see a lot of designers who think they're the bee's knees, um, you know, three years in. And when you actually look at their ability to really, truly get into a problem and really, truly come up with an interesting solution, they're, you know, they're, they're, they're mediocre at best. So, so yeah, bathing the problem um, and, 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 yeah, generate lots of solutions. That's, oh man, that's such a fun story. And that's really, really clever the way that you kind of force those those teams to go back out and continuously do that. I One of the things that I also really like too is force yourself mm. to come up with a new mm. solution every half a day. Uh, it was an exercise I used to do very early in my yeah. career in sketching and where I simply said, and this is actually from uh, another reference back to Adaptive Path, our friends there, uh, Leah Buley. And so she had come up with this six up sketch template and I used to force myself to come up with six different solutions within 15 minutes and I would actually time box myself and I, it didn't matter how similar or how different those six were i had to come up with six also i was just going to say a, a lot of this comes from i mean it's 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 a very classic um uh, product design school technique called 100 designs so you know on the first day or one of the first days of, of a, a product design school they'll ask their students to create 100 different designs for a chair and obviously the first 20 or 30 will just be you know obvious things they've seen around the next 20 or 30 they start to get kind of you know a little bit stuck but then they kind of like they keep powering through and then suddenly they start to get wacky and interesting and unusual and they start to kind of think differently and, and explore what it means to be a chair. And, and maybe it doesn't need to sort of follow these kind of, but it's only by 
expending energy and getting to this point of sort of frustration that you you've got rid of all the obvious solutions that you can end up coming and, and, and getting a really interesting one and so this hundred design process is is fairly common and, and that's sort of what we adapted with these these people um i think we did it you know asked them to get create something within half a day partly because this wasn't just something that was a known thing like a chair it was actually coming up with quite innovative solutions so they needed to spend a bit more time but yeah it, it perfectly matches with the six up one up templates which we use all the time i mean that's a great um sort of co-design tool so when we're doing kind of design thinking type workshops with clients who have no graphic design experience um six up one ups are a, a fantastic way of of forcing people because again like we see this even more with our clients our clients will get fixated on one solution but then once you force them to kind of cycle through other ideas, they then, you know, after half an hour, they realize why their solution wasn't the best solution and why a combination of a bunch of different things, that a bunch of different people came up, actually solved the problem in a more elegant way. And I think that's one of the challenges is, you know, I hate the idea of educating clients. That feels really patronizing. But I think there's something about allowing clients to experience in a small way the, the challenges, but also opportunities and insightful moments that design can bring can mean that when you're having conversations later down the line, they're much more empathetic and much more understanding about what you've gone through and, and don't just kind of have these very, very fixed mindsets that this is what I want and why haven't you designed the thing that I specified? Um, so yeah, these, these exercises can be very powerful. Sure. Let's take a step back to something that you were ta- saying too about you know, gathering this research information um, and creating insights, synthesizing it in some way, a couple themes popped up in mind, defining what the problem is, but more importantly, the themes or patterns you find in these conversations are, your, you know, you're forming your definition of what the problem is. It's your job to then go deeper and apply perhaps abductive reasoning to, to really understand why those themes or patterns exist. I'm curious to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, I think I'd probably largely agree. I mean, I I really do value design and design research. And there are, you know, there are, you know, when you have a highly optimised solution and it's working really, really well, um, really, really deep research can help you wring out those extra speed gains. And so in those situations, like having really, really detailed research, I think, helps. And having specialist external researchers will be able to uncover insights that there's no way that you could have ever uncovered yourself. On the other hand, my experience is 90% of the things that we get asked to solve are so broken that and there's so much low hanging fruit that it's kind of obvious what's wrong. Um, And in those situations, um, what I tend to find is, again, like researchers, I, I, I don't mean to kind of dismiss research, but a lot of researchers I've worked with, a lot of researchers I've seen, have this very kind of um, uh, deductive kind of process. So they'll, they'll see a problem that a user has, they'll immediately come up with a solution that solves that problem, and then they'll present the findings not as understanding what the problem is, but proffering up a solution. But those solutions can often be two dimensional. Um, The value, I think, is having designers um, live and experience um, the frustration and the problem. So you can't get that from reading report. You know, you can't fully understand what it feels like, the frustration levels that a user has when they're trying to do something in a timely manner and they can't do it by reading a report that says seven out of nine users failed this test. You can only experience it by feeling it or understand it by feeling it. And so later on down the line, you know, because stories are really, really important. If when you're coming to make a design decision, you've got your you've got your research report there and it says like seven out of nine people did X, that's not going to kind of hit you in the heart and it's not going to actually probably make a big input into your design decisions. But when you're looking at this thing and you're like, oh God, yeah, you know, when, when we saw these people use this, they really, really struggled. That becomes part of the narrative and that is the thing that kind of empowers the designer to solve that problem so in some way and this might sound a bit weird but i think designers doing their own research is the same as athletes doing their own stretching and warm-up you know you can't outsource the warm-up to somebody else you can't say to your coach well look coach i'm kind of a bit busy now you can do all the stretching for me and you you know hydrate and then when you're done i'll run the marathon 
You know, you need to kind of, you need to be loose and you need to kind of have that sort of physical awareness of what the problem is. And I think that's what that's what designers doing research should do. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that they should be the only people doing it. And I'm, and I'm really happy to have the coach along to sort of make sure that we're stretching in the right way. And, you know, we're not going to, you know, hurt ourselves or, or, or do anything inappropriate. And actually, if you've got big teams of people, you need researchers to plan and, and maybe um, deliver. But the designers have got to be actively involved. And, and just reading a PowerPoint deck or a presentation or, you know, a report is, is you, you know, you can't outsource that, that insight. So I don't know if that sort of answers your question. And maybe it does a bit. I think it does. And it added to it. I mean, just to... I think everything that we're touching on is really, yes, as an example of that seven out of nine people failed on this thing. That's a theme or a pattern that you might find, but you don't necessarily have a great understanding of why. And even a research mm. report, um, which is not a great way of communicating research anymore, uh, does not give you that why. And you should you should be able to feel that and apply your own worldview and experience to, to, to be able to apply that understanding of why that pattern existed. Which is sort of why I think sometimes I'm the only person left in the world that actually still likes personas. <laughs> um, I think I'm definitely the only person on Twitter that still actually likes personas because you open up Twitter and, and, you know, like literally every single day, a new thing has suddenly pr been pronounced dead or useless or worthless. Now, I'm not saying personas are the be or end all. Um, they have their their weaknesses and limitations, but I think they're a tool that people are basically using badly and then saying, you know, well, the tool's the problem. And the way I liken it is kind of like, you know, it, it, it's like a it's like a hammer, you know. Um, if you're doing DIY and all you have is a hammer, then you're probably going to make a mess of, of, of like putting up a set of shelves because you probably need a saw and you probably need a you know screw or whatever. And so if you go around smashing everything and going, oh, well, hammers are useless. I'm never going to use a hammer again. That's just daft. Um, and I would argue that, you know, actually in DIY, mostly you probably be using saws and maybe screws and hammers are kind of to you like used in only very specific situations, but they are still useful. And I find personas are a good way of encapsulating the stories you've heard and the data you've gathered from, from your interviews. I'm not interested in any of the demographic information. That's not what personas are, are there for. The demographic information is mostly to add um, richness to the to the, the memory. And you're stupid if you're, you know, you're you're making design decisions based on some mythical age or class or income on your personas that's not what they're there for but what they're there for is to encapsulate a set of behaviors and a set of user needs so that when you're thinking about design solutions you can kind of reflect back to um you can reflect back on on the research you did and so i still think they have value um you know the trend at the moment is jobs to be done which i think is great as well um, but I don't think it's necessarily, you know, either or one is good and one is bad. And I think particularly for organisations that have never been customer centric, um, personas can still be a useful tool um, to deliver that customer centricity. And, you know, to give you an example, like we recently redesigned our own website and we are dog food. You know, we 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 created personas based on all of the interactions that we'd had with our clients. And we're very, you know, very quickly able to break down our users into like multiple different types of people. And each one of them needed a, a very, very different set of information, uh, you know, in a different timely manner. They were looking for different things in their careers, et cetera, et cetera. And that massively helped not only the architecture and structure of our site, but also the content strategy. And we would never have been able to do that if we were focused purely on tasks and jobs. And we never would have been able to do that if we were focused purely on on like an amorphous user with no kind of um, distinct personality. And so, you know, I think there are ways that you can utilize um, design research um, to help encapsulate that. On the other hand, don't just then go, well, you know, everything we do has to have personas because that's dumb as well. You know, e you know, everything in moderation. Yeah, awesome. Let's say, Andy, this has been a really fantastic conversation, and I want to thank you again for joining us. Uh, I know I, I personally very much enjoyed it, and I think those who are listening will as well. Uh, only other thing I was going to ask you, is there anything in particular with those listening to the episode today? 
Oh, thank you. I mean, I've, I've had a, I've had a blast as well. And as you could probably tell, we could have done another hour. So um, I think that's very true. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, um, do please kind of reach out and I'd love to kind of have a chat with you at a, at a future episode, maybe when you get to, uh, when you get to sort of 26 or something or what, what have you in another 30 <laughs> episodes. Um, I, uh, the thing I'm working on at the moment, I've just started programming uh, the second edition of our new conference. So I run a bunch of conferences. I run a conference called UX London, which is um, in three weeks' time. It's not a plug because the tickets have sold out. Um, but the reason I kind of run conferences is often because I want to help push the industry forward. In fact, I think the whole purpose of Clear Left has been to kind of try and advance the community and the practice. So we advance we advance the quality of digital design through the design work we do. We advance it through the client interactions and helping the, 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 the client staff we work with. And a lot of our design work these days, as I probably said earlier, is actually going in and working alongside teams and coaching them and training them. And we do it through our blog posts and our talks and our books, etc. And also we do it through, you know, our conferences. And, you know, with a, with a client engagement, I, I can maybe help, you know, 10 clients a year with a conference like UX London, I can maybe help 200 designers. And if those 200 designers then help 10 other clients, then suddenly you've got thousands and thousands of people that you're you're helping and pushing forward. My latest endeavor has basically come out of having conversations with people like you, frankly, you know, conversations on podcasts, conversations over coffee and at conferences, where I've spoken to friends of mine that started off as bloggers and designers, and then they maybe had a small team of people they managed. And then they had a bigger team of people they managed. And then they were running a department. And then maybe they were, you know, you know, people like Peter Merholtz, who's now like, you know, uh, you know, vice president of X or whatever. I don't actually know what Peter's doing right at this second. But you know, previously he was vice president of design at Groupon, and he's done various other things since. I think he's at Capital One now. And all of these people had similar stories. They've moved into um, management. And they were trying to figure out how to restructure their orgs to to allow more space for design, how to create the right culture for design, how to hire the right people, how to manage up, manage down, look after the growth of their teams. Like there's so many roles that, that designers have. And then you've got kind of new emerging disciplines like design ops, which is all around how to um turn design into a really optimized system and you, you tend to have design ops in very very large organizations like airbnb where design is operating at such a high scale you need operational people to kind of make sure that the the, the, the it's working as efficiently and, and friction free as possible so last year i set up a new conference called leading design which was in london in october at the barbican which is a fantastic historic design venue and it was an absolute blast we had um Mike Davidson, uh, one of my friends who was ex-VP of Twitter. Um, we had Rochelle from uh, VP of Design at Spotify and a whole bunch of other really, really smart people. Many of them you would just wish that you'd had them as a boss like at some stage. And they just kind of shared. And it was a really open, honest conversation about some of the, the, the struggles and the challenges. There was advice, but also there was like self-care information you know it can be quite tough being a boss when you know you're you know you're the only person of your kind in your team and you're struggling with kind of you know how to deal with day-to-day -day work and so that was good and so the next one is is happening in the uk in october um we had a whole bunch of people from the us and, and europe fly out so it's not just a, a british thing um tickets aren't available yet but if you go to leading design dot org i think or maybe leadingdesign.com i should know this information just type leading design in your favorite browser um search engine and it will pop up and yeah you know if you're if you're in a in a space where you're managing anybody more than one person or even if you want to get into management that would be quite a good thing to come to and particularly if you or any of your listeners know of any great design leaders maybe people that they've worked under um and they've really admired who have given them some great advice you know please ask them to ping me the details at andy bud on twitter and i'm always looking for amazing speakers um particularly speakers of of, of color or particularly speakers that come from um less sort of um backgrounds that that, that have less sort of um visibility um then then please sort of point them in my direction and i'd love to kind of yeah have a chat once again, Andy, thank you so much for joining us. This has been a real blast. Uh, likewise, Zach, it's been, a, it's been my pleasure. Thank you. Awesome. And then that'll be all she wrote. Brilliant. That was good. I enjoyed that. If you enjoyed this episode, consider leaving us a rating on iTunes or wherever it is that you listen to our podcast. 
And also, you can fill out our podcast survey where you can let us know if someone awesome that we should have on the show and even tell us about the things you would want to hear about, topics that are interesting for you. You can check that out in the show notes or on our website. Thanks for listening to Aurelia's podcast, talking about product strategy and design strategy. We are the first platform of its kind to help you solve the right problems for your customers and your business and build products and services that truly matter. You can check us out at aureliuslab.com. That is www.aureliuslab.com. You can check us out on Twitter at Aurelius Lab and Instagram Aurelius Lab. We'll see you next time.